What's the word, family? Today is exciting because this is going to be the first episode of my podcast, Music Theory. And in this podcast, we're going to discuss a range of issues and ideas that all relate or tie back into music in some way, shape, or form. Today's episode, we're going to talk about sync licensing and specifically exclusive versus non-exclusive music libraries. Now, in this presentation or in this episode, again, we're going to discuss not only strategies on how to get your music within these libraries, but we're also going to discuss specific terminology that's going to be needed in order for you to make the most informed decision on which type of library that you want to put your music in. Let's get into it. So first, I think that it makes the most sense for us to start off with specific terms that we need to know. Let's break down what exclusive versus non-exclusive means. So as you can see on the screen, for those of you that are listening, take notes. An exclusive library is going to be a music collection that is available only for licensing and use by one client or entity at a time. This is going to be there are two types of exclusive contracts that you could run into or two types of exclusive libraries that you can run into. The first is going to be total exclusivity. Now, this is going to be music that cannot be posted, sold or distributed anywhere. This is going to include places like YouTube, DistroKid or any other, you know, entity that's going to send your music out to Apple Music or any anywhere. Right. Then we also have the partial exclusivity. Now, these deals with libraries will outline what can or cannot be done. There may or may not be flexibility for you to ask for, you know, if you have your own YouTube channel, for say, for instance, and you want to post your own music video or you want to post your own music to sort of have a public profile of your of your of your music available. That's up to the library to make that uh, decision. And more so, it's up to you to ask that library. So what this means from an exclusive standpoint is that once a client licenses a piece of music from an exclusive library, no other client or entity can use that same piece of music during the term of that license. That's the important part to note here. It's almost the same as if you sell an exclusive beat to somebody or an exclusive track to somebody. The term exclusive means that it's usually going to belong to one person or entity at a time. Again, not all exclusive contracts are made equal. So you want to have these conversation with the library before you sign that contract. Because again, there might be a bit of ability for you to negotiate. Next, we have non-exclusive. So a non-exclusive music library is a collective or is a collection of music that is available for licensing and used by multiple clients or entities at the same time. So for here, we want to make sure to check library license um, because again, not all of these are made equal as well, and they will have different terms. If you have questions here, you want to ask the library and make sure you put your, not, I want to, don't want to sound, um, tough, <laughs> but you want to put your foot down. You want to ask all the questions that you have. Don't, there's no such thing as a dumb question unless you don't ask it, then it becomes a dumb question. So again, this means that multiple clients can license and use the same piece of music at the same time without infringing on each other's licenses. Non-exclusive libraries start to open us up to different terms like retitling, and we'll talk about that here in a second. Remember that if something doesn't make sense, you can always ask the library to explain. And even more so, if there's something that you don't agree with, you can ask for different aspects of the contract to be changed. It doesn't mean that they're going to do it. But you know, again, there's a, the, 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 the saying closed mouths don't get fed. That applies in this situation. Let's continue. So next we have the term perpetuity. So perpetuity in the context of music libraries refers to the term of the license agreement between the library and the client. If a license is granted in perpetuity, it means that the client has the right to use the licensed music indefinitely for as long as they wish without any time restrictions. Folks, this means forever. Forever. They can use your music forever. If you're in a situation or position where you're unable to make music on a regular basis and you have a rather small cat uh, catalog, it may not make sense for you to sign a deal in perpetuity 
unless the numbers make sense. The financials, the dollars. If it doesn't make sense for you, do not sign a deal in perpetuity. Again, the client has the right to use the licensed music forever without needing to renew or negotiate or renegotiate the license agreement with the music library. This can be a valuable feature for clients who want to ensure the long-term availability of a specific piece of music for their project or brand. From the, from the company's perspective or the library's perspective or whoever's using the, the song, it's an amazing deal because they get to keep that music forever. It can also be a great deal for the, in the composer or producer or songwriter because, again, if I'm going to sign a deal in perpetuity for a song like for, for Lion King, say, for instance, or like a Titanic or some of these really, really big films that have continued to live through generations and in different eras. For me, that perpetuity makes sense because this, these, these songs and the, 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 these movies will play forever, right? So let's look at retitling. So we talked about it a little bit earlier as it referred to the um, non-exclusive libraries. So retitling in the context of a music library refers to the practice of giving a new and unique title to a pre-existing piece of music. This allows a music library to register the retitled version of the music with the performing rights organization or a PRO under a new name. They will also collect royalties for the usage of the music under that name. So what does that mean? So say we have library A and we have library B. We're just gonna call them A and B for now to make this as simple as possible. The name of your song is called Dancing in the Sunshine, right? So Library A, they get the song first. They're a non-exclusive library. And so we're going to we're going to go with that song title, Dancing in the Sunshine. So Dancing in the Sunshine, it's a non-exclusive library. You sign a non-exclusive contract, basically stating again that you're able to use that music non-exclusively and to as many people as possible. Then you have Library B, also a non-exclusive library. They also want to use that same song, Dancing in the Sunshine, but they can't use that specific name because it's already been registered by another company. So this is where retitling comes into play. They're going to rename the song. We'll say Sunshine is Forever. It's going to be the same song, just with different names to it. That's what retitling it does. So when you're in the business of non-exclusive libraries, retitling is extremely common and you can expect it to happen this is where you want to make sure you're taking time to take notes of the new titles that they're giving your song and then as they register it to your your pro whether it's ascap bmi csac wherever they register it to you want to make sure you have a note of those uh, song names so that when you get your your checks or your statements from your pro you'll be able to tell the difference between, okay, this is the library that got this song placed, this is the library that got this song placed, and this is the title of that song. Remember, a music library may take a piece of the music that has already been released under one title and retitle it for their use in their library. This allows the library to create a new asset that can be licensed and used by clients, while also generating additional revenue streams through performance royalties. So that's sort of the big title here, is that retitling, again, is literally the retitling of music that has already been released. Okay. Here, like I have mentioned at the bottom, you want to make sure that you want to get a legal assistance before signing anything in a contract that you do not understand. Imagine not knowing what perpetuity means and you legally sign away your favorite song forever. Like for me, I don't always have the time in a day to make a ton of music. So, and I'm, positive that a lot of you are also in that same boat so whatever music that you do create and you get to the point where you want to submit it to a library if you don't understand or know that the library is it's an exclusive forever contract for that specific piece of music you you can be you you can be up a creek without a paddle to say the least the next set of terms that we want to discuss are a blanket license fee and sync fees so what is a blanket licensing fee? So a blanket license, a blanket license in context of the music library is a type of license agreement that allows a client to use any music from the library without needing to obtain individual licenses for each piece of music. A blanket license are often used in situations where a client needs to use a large amount of music for a project, such as a television network that needs music for multiple shows. 
By obtaining a blanket license from a music library, the client can streamline the license process and avoid the need to negotiate individual licenses for each piece of music. What this means is that the client pays a single fee for access to the entire library and can use any music in that library as often as they wish during the term of that agreement. Now, the terms of those agreements can vary from library to library. Again, you want to make sure that you're asking some of these questions so that you understand what you're signing up for. Sync fees. So what is a sync fee? So a sync fee in the context of a library refers to the fees that a client pays for the synchronization or sync of music with visual media such as film, television, or advertising. In a music library context, a sync fee is typically paid by the client to the library in exchange for the right to synchronize a specific piece of music with their visual media. The sync fee can vary depending on factors such as the duration of the usage, the scope of the project, and the popularity of the music. So in some cases, the music library may also receive a percentage of the performance royalties generated by the usage of the music in the visual media. So here are the blanket license fees and here are the sync fees. The last term that I want to give you all is going to be called a consideration fee. So a consideration fee is a fee charged by the library for considering a client's request for a custom music composition. When a client requests a, co a custom composition from a music library, the library's team of composers and music producers, you, will receive will review the request and determine whether it is feasible and within the scope of their capabilities. This is where you are directly given a, a fee or a, or a compensation just for submitting your music and it being considered, right? So again, if the library decides to move forward with the custom composition, they may charge the client a consideration fee. This covers the time and resources, basically your energy, your time and your, your money, your, your DAW, your plugins that you're using, the instrumentation that you're using, whatever resources that you're needing and use to create that music to review the request and develop a proposal for the custom composition, right? So the consideration fee is usually a non-refundable fee, regardless of whether or not the client ultimately decides to proceed with the custom composition or not. Now, again, this fee is charged, say, by um, like Sony or whatever. So say Sony's looking for music for a movie or whatever or Universal or whatever, right? The library A might charge Universal or Sony or whatever the company is a fee just to consider possibly using their music for their movie, right? This happens all the time. So hopefully that explains a little bit of what some of these these terms are and you start to become familiar before we even get to look at a contract or anything like that. You need to understand these terms. So let's look at the money. How these is this is how the library is paid. This is important to know because the library pays you. If you don't understand how the library is getting their money, you will miss out on money and you'll miss out on conversations. You'll miss out on um, specific questions that you can ask a library to be considered for maybe some of these fees, right? So we talked about blanket fees, consideration fees, and sync fees. If you look at a blanket fee as it relates to how the library is paid. So in general, a blanket license fee for music libraries can range from a few hundred dollars to several thousand dollars or even more. This is depending on the library and the specific terms of the license agreement, right? So some music libraries may offer tiered pricing based on the size or duration of the project, while others may charge a flat rate for unlimited use of their entire music catalog. Make sense? Next we have is a, next we have again a consideration fee. So this is usually offered by exclusive libraries only. And again, this is paid directly to the producer or composer, you. So again, normally pay per track ranging from $50 to thousands of dollars. So if you submit an album's worth of music, say five to 10 songs, you get paid for each one of those songs that are being considered for use in a particular project. That's a lot of money. That could be a lot of money, even if it's just $50, right? Even if you get $50 for 10 tracks, you got a nice little chunk of change just for them considering using your, your music. That sounds pretty cool. But again, if you don't know what a consideration fee is, you don't even know to ask if this library is going to be giving consideration fees. You start to see where you're losing money, right? 
So again, the consideration fee may vary depending on the specific music library and the scope and complexity of the custom composition request. In some cases, the consideration fee may be a flat rate, while in others, it may be a percentage of the estimated cost of the custom composition. Again, you want to ask the libraries these questions. If you have a brief that's popped up or you have a custom request that has come through and now the library has approached you to make music for this particular request, you can ask the library if, you know, there's any consideration fees. Remember, by this point, you're already accepted into the library. So it's you're OK to ask these types of questions. It also makes it look like that you're serious about your business as well. Again, you want to make sure that you remain professional because this is a relationship that you're having with a library at this point. You don't want to burn any bridges by trying to get more, just trying to get paid and try to get a bunch of money. But you also don't want to be walked over either as well. So there's a fine line. But again, I think that if you approach the situation with professionalism and honestly, just the understanding of what these fees are and how, how they're paid out, it helps you kind of approach that each situation uniquely and hopefully it leads to you getting more money. Lastly, we have the sync fee. So in general, sync fees for music libraries can range from a few hundred dollars to hundreds of thousands of dollars. This depends on the complexity and scope of the project, the intended distribution channels and the intended use of the music. So in some cases, music libraries may offer a flat fee for the use of a particular work. While others, the fee may be based on a percentage of the total project budget or the overall licensing fee. This is going to vary from library to library and project to project. So, again, being able to ask those questions is important. Let's now take a look at how you get money as a producer, composer or songwriter. Let's look at the blanket fee. So producers and composers don't always get a piece of this pie. This is an unfortunate truth, but it's it's just kind of how the cookie crumbles in a lot of these situations. It doesn't hurt to inquire about this fee. However, the worst they can say is no. I talked about it earlier. So you'd be surprised just asking the question could lead to you getting a piece of that, especially if you're in a library where you've contributed quite a bit. You might be surprised because if you're if you're helping a specific library gain a lot of placements opportunities, they may very well give you a small piece of that pie just to keep you around. Again, when you're signing a contract to any music library, it's almost a by song basis or by album basis, right? It's not your entire literal catalog of music. Let me give you an example. I can have a catalog of 100 songs. The library A, that's an exclusive library. I only want to give 25 of my songs to. Only those 25 songs belong to this library. That's it. My other 75 songs are, are mine to do whatever I want to do with. Make sense? If you're with your 25 songs, if you're consistently landing relatively decent sized placements, even if they're small placements, you're generating income for this music library as well. So don't sell yourself short. And a lot of times, again, if you start to become in that 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 nice bucket of income for this music library, you you have a bit of, of room to negotiate, I will say. So, again, after that contract is over and you have a library who's, you know, getting a rather large amount of blanket fees and they're in no way, shape or form wanting to give you any of that. I'm not saying leave the library. I'm just saying it's you just now know that there might be a conversation that you can have again just because you ask that does not mean they're going to give it to you remember that i would also say too don't burn a bridge what they say don't cut off your nose to spite your face if they're landing you a lot of placements and still say no to blanket fees that's now an option that you have to weigh think of it this way if this say library if they're netting you on average let's say $50,000 a year because they don't give you a piece of the blanket fee. Are you going to cut them off? That's a question that you might want to ask yourself. For me, I'm not cutting my nose off despite my face. I'm going to, I'm going to accept those fees and you know, I, I, I will, I might look at other libraries, but again, at this point, I'm also continuing to make music. Okay. Well, so for the consideration fee, 
So not all libraries off offer consideration fees. Like the above, it doesn't hurt to ask here. Same situation. Just because a library or a company is not giving you a fee for considering the use of your music, in, in my head, it's not even a part of my own strategy to automatically get consideration fees. To me, a consideration fee is like the like the cherry on top. It's like the 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 surprise under under the foam of a of a snack, right? <laughs> it's the it's the hidden stuff that I, oh I wasn't expecting that. That's a nice thank you. Like thank you. For me, again, it doesn't hurt to ask, but this is the specific fee that I wouldn't I wouldn't put a lot of uh stock in, if you will. Lastly, again, we have the sync fee. So this is this is what's usually split between the composer and the producer and the library, right? This is where you'll see where the most common deal is usually 50-50, but it can be 75-25 in the library's favor, 60-40, or the combination or any combination of equaling up to 100%. You want to make sure that you read the agreement here. If you all want me to show an example of a library that's offering a 75-25 split in favor of the library, let me know in the comment section below. I have quite a few libraries that I am able to show you all and am willing to show you all. But again, for me, I want to make sure this is content that you all actually want to see. I'm doing it either way. I'm involved with, with music libraries. I'm involved with creating music with the goal of getting it on film and t TV video games, all of the above. So for me, I have a list of over 150 music libraries that I haven't even yet submitted to myself, but I have a ton that are on my list and I have a ton that I've researched and I have a ton that I know that may be beneficial for you all. But if you all don't want to see it, that's fine. I guarantee you there's going to be some people that want to see it. If you do, let me know in the comment section below. And again, I will walk you through that library that's offering a 75 25 split in favor of the library but again it's a unique situation and i think you all might enjoy it let's move on to the next one so we talked about an exclusive library we talked about a non-exclusive library but now let's talk about the pros and cons of both an exclusive and non-exclusive library okay so the pros of an exclusive library number one is going to be confidence flat out Clients are more likely to buy because they know that they aren't um, they know that there aren't a bunch of other music producers out there licensing the same song for less. This is important, right? If you understand, just think of it. If any of you make beats for artists, they have a similar mindset as well. That's why a lot of people want to buy the exclusive rights because they want to be the only one that are making music to a particular beat or to a particular song, right? So. It's the same thing from a from a bigger company. Imagine, so imagine a song like, so like Kendrick Lamar's. Kendrick Lamar has a song like the the damn that was super big in like Black Panther, right? Imagine that being the only movie that that song went in, and with it already being a big song with a huge artist, that's a lot of confidence. Like, oh man, people not only love this song already, but if they hear it. It just creates a lot of value for that individual company. Keep that in mind. The next pro of an exclusive library is going to be that they have a higher payout through and through. Nine times out of 10, you're going to get more money from songs that are placed with an exclusive library. Again, if you look along the top, you already see my points here. License licensees are willing to pay more for your song because they know they are the only ones with the rights to sync it. That increases the price of your music and it makes it more expensive by default. Next, you have a single POC or single point of contact. So you don't need to track what 20 different businesses are doing with your music as opposed to like a non-exclusive library, which we'll talk about here in a second. You know that if you're dealing with library A, that's exclusive, that if they get their song to Universal or whatever, Tyler Perry Studios, whatever, you know that, okay, you're only dealing with this one library or this one business. Much easier to kind of keep track of who's using your music and where they're using it. Taco Bell, McDonald's, Burger King, Adidas, Nike, whatever, right? That leads me to the last point, which is the high value client. So again, 
exclusive libraries sound expensive and for good reason. These libraries have strong relationships with higher paying clients. It's the whole concept of, you know, again, if it's exclusive, it looks good. You know, you want to, you're going to pay more for the, the perceived value goes up. Think of a Lamborghini. You don't see Lamborghini commercials for a reason. You don't see higher end commercials for a reason. Like there's literally a reason why you don't see these type of commercials is because it'll lower the perceived value, right? People, and I think there was even a, 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 a somebody said, I heard on the interview somewhere, some, I can't remember where I heard it. They said, you don't see Lamborghini commercials because the people watching, the people that are buying Lamborghinis don't, they're not sitting around watching TV, right? You all get the concept, you all get the concept, right? Higher value clients are more drawn to exclusive libraries because there's this concept of an expensive sound, an expensive song, an expensive music, right? Let's look at the cons of an exclusive library. So the cons of an exclusive library. So first we have the lack of sales. So you risk signing an exclusive long-term contract that company not getting you any sinks. So that's that's a real situation that you could find yourself in you could have written the music you could have written say the same 25 songs that we talked about earlier i signed 25 songs to an exclusive library and none of them get synced and so now i'm locked into a three five-year deal with the company that they're not landing any placements for any of my music so you start to hopefully kind of formulate a strategy for yourself because i I can give you my strategies day in and day out and time and time again, but I, I use a combination of both, giving my music to both non-exclusive and exclusive libraries just for this reason. I might love my song. I might think that, oh man, this is the best thing since sliced bread. I'm going to get this placed in a, in a Madden video game. I'm going to get this placed in a in, at the next action movie. Um, you all know I'm on my current journey to an NBA placement. That's a real strong goal of mine. Um, yeah, that's just that's what I want to do, and I, I'm gonna get it done. Um, so against that same concept, there you might have a lack of sales. Next is the lack of exposure. When you are starting, it is sometimes better to have your music heard by as many people as possible than when you have made a name for yourself. You can start selling more exclusive rights. This, in my opinion, is on the weaker end of a con for an exclusive library. To me. The lack of exposure, it, it doesn't mean anything to me because most of you can't name the composers or producers who made the soundtrack to, let's say, the Black Panther. You might be able to name a couple of outliers, but you can't, you can name a couple of artists. You can, I guarantee you can't name the composers that produced the music for that movie or any of the other movies that have come out in the past five or 10 years. Don't let notoriety be like your main turnoff for not submitting to an exclusive library because at the end of the day, most of us that submit music for film and TV are unknowns, if you will. But my bank account's not unknown, so that there you go. Kind of choose your battles here. Next, we have long contracts. So contracts may lock you in longer than you would like, especially if your music becomes popular and you want to shop it around. So... To me, this is a good problem to have, right? Especially if my music is getting placed and I now and now I have a bunch of, of different companies reaching out to me and say, hey, Taylor, I want to have your music used for X or for X or for X. I can now have a conversation with them and say, hey, you know, I, I'm sorry that I, I can't release this specific music now because I'm currently under contract for X number of years. However, I'm now, I can make something really pretty close or pretty identical to that you know, just let me know what you're thinking. Let me know what your thoughts are. And then you can have that conversation there. To me, again, this particular situation is a good problem to have. But again, if you if you tie that long contract with the lack of sales, that can be a really big problem. Because again, now you're you're truly locked in to a contract for these particular songs. I want to clear this up really quick before I move forward. And I said it earlier, but I have to make sure I say it again. 25 songs out of my hundred. If I sign all of those songs to an exclusive library, that's just those 25 songs. Again, if you're in a position where you are able to make a ton of music, this might not even be a problem for you. You just make 25 more songs. 
and you continue pushing, you'll go to another library and you'll kind of start this process all the way over. So it's free to you. It might really not be a problem to me. That's my situation. It, I wouldn't care. I've do my research thoroughly enough beforehand to understand, okay, this is the library I want to get into. This is the type of music that I want to submit to this library. This is what my plan is for this library. These are the songs I made for this library. And, and that's, that's how I maneuver. Lastly, we have the music output. So if you aren't able to crank out music quickly, kind of talked about it already, then locking yourself um, into a long-term deal with essentially hold your music hostage. We talked about it already. It could be a con, it could be a pro, it depends on how much music you crank out and what your overall time and availability to make one particular song is and what that's worth to you. It varies for everybody. Let's look at let's now look at the pros of a non-exclusive library. So here we have more exposure. So non-exclusive licensing agreements allow you to shop your music around to multiple licensees to get more ears listening to your music. Talked about it earlier. You can have a, you can submit the same 25 songs to a non-exclusive library to multiple non-exclusive libraries. Now, make sure that you're reading their contracts and seeing exactly what they're made up of. Because again, not all non-exclusive contracts or any contract is made equal. So you want to ask the questions. But in general, you can definitely get more exposure and potentially make more money, which brings us to maximizing small opportunities if you have a chance to license the music yourself or offer it as a free sample you don't need to worry about its legality you don't have to worry about what type of licenses to offer here or what type of uh, licenses to offer there you know you can maximize on all of those smaller opportunities because you're opening opening yourself up to more people being available to use your music more revenue although not guaranteed it is possible that more companies you have licensing your music the more money you stand to make from it at this point, the non-exclusive, to me, the non-exclusive library game is more about the numbers. And in my experience, and you can check for yourself, non-exclusive libraries tend to have cheaper sounding music. It's just, it's not as good. If you want an example of me showing you sort of the difference between a cheap sounding library and an expensive sound, let me know in the comment section below. This is, I think, an, an extremely important thought or process to have here because if you're a composer or producer that makes really high quality music and you put it in a non-exclusive library, you now, I will say, you, you'll definitely have the chance to make a pretty decent amount of money because again, your music is gonna completely stand apart from everyone else's because again, you it, it's that you have that expensive sound, but you just decided for, for a strategic stake um, sake to get it into a non-exclusive library makes sense lastly is placements you can still land large placements with non-exclusive libraries that's that's just it is what it is so don't don't get it stuck that you have to go to an exclusive library to land larger placements because in reality you don't next we're going to talk about the cons of a non-exclusive library so the first con will be is that is devaluing your music. So some of the top shoppers only work with companies that license music exclusively. This is a reality as well. Um, the term devaluing your music, it it's up to the individual or it's up to the company, but it's like that same argument that you hear people talking about when you see those deals, those super bulk deals where it's like 75 beats or 77 beats for ten dollars does it devalue your music maybe does it earn you some money on the back end maybe it's up to you next you have organization it will be hard to keep track of all the places you license to and even harder to know if one of your songs is being used without your permission so this will definitely vary from library to library non-exclusive library to non-exclusive library but again it's something that you want to take note of Next, no control. So the same can be said about an exclusive deal. However, if you are floating a lot of music around through multiple non-exclusive contracts, it is more likely that your music will end up in projects that you would rather not hear it in. I'll use myself as an example. Because I'm a Christian and I, I have certain feelings and opinions about 
my music being used in like say for instance a violent movie scene where someone's getting their head cut off or like there's just like a bunch of crazy stuff going on or maybe about some demonic stuff going on that i that i i don't even watch that type of stuff if i put my music in the non-exclusive library i don't have control over who decides to use my music for whatever project so depending on your spiritual compass or your moral compass whatever you want to call it if that's something that you find yourself in or you are in that same dilemma or that same position i'll say that is something to strongly recommend or take into consideration because again you can't control where your music is placed in these particular situations next no consideration so non-exclusive libraries do not offer consideration fees we talked about consideration fees earlier and even most exclusive libraries don't offer consideration fees so it's again to me this shouldn't be part of your overall strategy now these are a few questions that i i like to ask every library that i we're going to get into contact with especially if i've been signed to that library the first what rights am i signing off if any right if so for me i have a youtube channel and i like to show you all my process for making particular songs i build that into my contracts so the songs that you all see me making these are songs that are in a library right i bake that into the contract so that for me i'm able to not only show you all my process but i'm also protecting myself at the same time the second question how long is the term of the contract? This is usually up front and it's it's usually front and center and you you usually know how long the contract is going to be. But if, if it doesn't hurt to ask, there might be a situation where you can change the term of the contract based upon whatever the agreement is. An example here could be, say for instance, you have 25 songs, to keep my same example. So you have 25 songs that you're wanting, wanting to get to a library, it doesn't matter if they're exclusive or non-exclusive. With those 25 songs, you're saying that, okay, well, because I'm giving you a rather large amount of work um, and this is my first interaction with your library, I would like to, you know, see if it's okay. I know you normally only offer five-year contracts. However, since it's, you know, our first rodeo, um, I would like to see, you know, can we cut that in half? So can we do two and a half years or can we do two years just to see how the, the songs do in your library and if in the contingency, so if you make... If you're landing a decent amount of places and you want to put a number on it, you don't want to leave it vague because decent could be five, right? If you land, I'm going to throw something out. Let's say if I land $20,000 worth of placements for your, for, for within that time frame, that two-year time frame, then I will sign, I will automatically re-sign another contract with your library for these songs for an additional four or five years, right? these are you can have these conversations and again i just gave you a lot of game just with that particular strategy which brings me to if you are enjoying the video so far please like and subscribe to the channel you don't have people that are giving you this level of of interaction this level of information that's really going to help you get to that next level this is again the first episode of a long-standing podcast series that i plan on continuing again you see that at the bottom the music theory podcast all right you also see the music collective that I'm a part of. This is my personal music collective. I'm currently in the process of building a music library of my own. Still haven't worked out the specifics of how to accept music from other composers and producers, but the people that I currently have on the team now, that is literally what our goal is. We make music together with the idea and overall goal to get our music on film, TV, and video games. This is what we do at Unbounded Music Collective. The third question, how much percentage of my royalties are they keeping? By they, we mean the company, the library. How much percentage are they keeping on the back end? Now, we're not talking about the upfront sync fees or any of the upfront stuff. We're talking the back end stuff, the writer share, the, the publisher share, right? Even after the contract ends, you want to have an understanding of how much of those royalties are going to be kept even after the contract is over. Sometimes they're still going to keep that same percentage that they were getting beforehand because they're the ones that got you the placement in the first place. It, it's not unfair for them at all. I'm going to be honest. It's not unfair. But you want to at least know, right? 
So you don't want to have it in your head that after this two year deal or this five year deal that, you know, you all were splitting 50 50 of the royalties. And then now you get your songs back that they're going to continue to get 50 percent of those royalties after the contract is over. Right. So you want to ask those questions again before you sign anything, because that might not be something that you want to do. Something to take a note of. All right. So the fourth question is going to be, do I get a percentage of the sync fees or not? You want to know out the gate if you're going to get a percentage of any of the sync fees that are included. Again, this is going to be the biggest fee that is received by the library. Do you get a percentage of it or not? You want to know that question because, yeah, you'll get your money on the back end, which is that's the fun part because that's where the royalty statements and the checks start to come in from ASCAP, BMI, or whatever PRO you're with. That's the fun part. But that upfront money is nice, too. So you want to know what percentage of that that you're actually getting. My golden rule. This is my golden rule here. Protect your writer share at all costs. Protect your share at all costs. You wrote the music. You composed the music. You produced the music. You wrote the song to the music. Hold on to that like it's your life. This is how you're going to stay getting paid for the work that you've already done. It's, if your song continues to circulate on film, TV, video games, advertisements, YouTube videos, TikToks, whatever you want to call it, you're getting paid for that. But if you let go of your ridership because you don't know to ask those questions, you can be up a creek without a paddle. Remember that. Remember that. All right, folks, that was a lot of information. And i sorry the video got a little bit longer than what I wanted it to be. However, that's the problem that I see with a lot of the content on here. There's maybe two or three other guys that talk about sync licensing stuff on YouTube that I think do a really great job. I have a link to their channels down in the description below because I think that there's enough there's enough out here for everybody. I can't submit to every single placement opportunity. I can't. You can't. They can't. So get as much information as you can out here, folks. And for me, again, hopefully you all found this video instructional and, you know, you'll, you'll find it that it's going to help you land either more placements or at least the, to make the decision or the determination on which type of library that you want to have your music placed in. If you enjoy the video, like and subscribe to the channel. I took a little bit longer to formulate this video because, again, I don't want to fall into that trap or that snare of rushing to get a video out just for video's sake. This is a long game for me on YouTube, and I'm here for the long haul. All right, y'all. Peace.